The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself. At the end, forever, you and I will be in heaven or hell, period. All right, let's um, finish this last conference. We've come to the end already. These things go so fast. I, I, don't, I wish we had a lot more time, but we'll do the best we can. We come to chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, continuing the Spirit's word to the churches of Asia, the Holy Spirit's word to the church, to us, right here and right now, to the, to the angel, the presiding spirit of the church in Sardis, write this. The one who holds the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, has this to say to you and to me. I know your conduct. I know the reputation you have of being alive when in fact you are dead. Wake up. Wake up and strengthen what remains before it dies. The Holy Spirit says to the church in the United States and in many other countries throughout the world, I know the reputation you have of being alive when in fact you are dead. Looks good. You're doing this and you're doing that. But you're dead. Wake up. Wake up before it is too late. Wake up and strengthen what remains before it dies. Church in the United States, stop playing games with yourself. The bishops tell us that 75% of us don't even go to Mass on Sunday. I'm not saying that's all there is to our faith. There's much more than that, I know. But it is one indicator. If you're not even going on Sunday, where are you getting sanctifying grace? Do you know what sanctifying grace is? It is a share in divine life. Every now and then a good woman will come up to me and say, Oh, Father, my husband's a good man. And I know what's coming. He's a good man, but he doesn't go to church. That's okay, isn't it? Nope. That highly theological response. Nope. Well, but he's a good man. I'm sure he is. He has a lot of natural goodness. He's not a murderer. He doesn't do horrible things. We are not called to a mere natural end. We are called to a supernatural end, union with the Most Holy Trinity. How do you achieve that? To sanctifying grace, a share in God's own life, which we primarily receive from the seven sacraments. Now, I am not saying that a person can't be saved who doesn't receive the sacraments. It is possible. You can... You can be saved in an extraordinary way. But the ordinary way is baptism with water and then the other sacraments which we need. Sure, a Buddhist, a Hindu, or somebody else who lives in accordance with the natural law in their heart, who tries to live the best they can, yes, of course, it is possible they can be saved. All right. But for you and for I, that means that We've got to do the best we can. We've got to live our faith. And much of the church is dead, not alive. And yet we seem to go on skating along as though, well, it's no big deal. So what if 50, 60, 70 percent of Catholics, as some polls say, don't believe in the real presence in the Eucharist? That is the source, the center, and the summit of our Christian faith. What do you have if you don't have the source, the center, and the summit? 
No, not much. That's the Eucharist. I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking to Catholics here. Good Baptists live your good Baptist faith. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to Catholics who reject their faith. We better wake up and strengthen what's left. Or the whole thing's going to be dead. And don't think it can't happen. Entire local churches were wiped out. And to this day haven't recovered. Because we, through indifference or cowardice, drifted off into a heresy of one kind or another. We are in danger in our country, in the church, in this country, of playing fast and loose with the truth for just a little bit too long. The Holy Father says, you must do this and you must do this. Someone, the media once asked Cardinal Gagnon from Quebec, how, how can this go on? You know, how can the Holy Father allow these things in the church? Cardinal Gagnon's response was, the bishops from all over the world go to Rome for their ad limina visits. And the Holy Fathers say, now brothers, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this, and I don't want you to do that, and I don't want you to do that. And they say, yes, Holy Father, yes, Holy Father. And they go back and do what they've done well pleased. The Pope doesn't have prisons to lock them up in. Cardinal Gagno said he was the prefect for the sacred congregation and the family before. We have to wake up and fast. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen if we don't. If we keep waiting around for somebody else to do it, nobody else is going to do it. And then, as St. Jerome once said, the whole church will wake up to find itself, he said, Arian. That was a heresy back in the 4th and early 5th century. The whole church one day woke up to find it was Arian. I don't know what you call this heresy, but there is a heresy, very subtle. And because so subtle, very dangerous. Because when you're not aware of it and you slip into it, and gradually your faith is eroded away until finally there's no reverence left for the Eucharist. All right, listen. Many things. I'll give you an example. It is not a mortal sin necessarily that the tabernacle is removed from the center of the church. There's a contemporary thing to start a fight. Now, the tabernacle is to be in a prominent place, but all right. Now, what happens, though, when we do that, when we don't make an external sign of reverence, when people receive communion in the hand without understanding what it is that they're doing? No, and those things in themselves aren't evil. No one of them is fatal. But they can, if we're not properly instructed, they can contribute towards a gradual erosion of the doctrine. If we no longer give the Lord reverence in his own house, we don't genuflect, we don't make the sign of the cross, we come up casually like we're going to receive a cookie or a potato chip at communion. The tabernacle's in a broom closet. I'm going to tell you something in tears. There is a parish in a diocese not far from here where they literally have the tabernacle in a broom closet. You can look through a side window and see a broom laying against the tabernacle. And I know because we've seen it. Now that is unbelievable, you say. I agree, it is unbelievable. If I didn't see it with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe it either. Now what does that do? It erodes away the source, center, and summit of our faith if we, you know, we pray as we believe. There's an old saying, an axiom in Latin, lex orande, lex credende. The church prays as she believes. Now in the liturgy, this is very important. The way we conduct ourselves in liturgical celebration manifests what we believe. There is a very close unity between the doctrine of the faith and the discipline of the sacraments. 
And when we begin to act like we don't really believe that Jesus is there, and I don't care how many times you say, oh, I believe it, I believe what the church believes, I believe that he's there, then why are you acting as though he's not there? Oh, I believe in this, but we shouldn't have adoration. Oh, I believe in the Eucharist, in the real presence, then why don't you want anybody to kneel in his presence? And don't think that's a coincidence. It's an unholy convergence of facts. Now, some of the people are unwitting pawns. They don't know any better. I'm not saying they're outright evil. But the devil knows what he's doing. And I'm telling you, we're getting to the point where if we're not careful, we're going to wake up to find out we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Most of us don't realize this precious gift we have in the Eucharist. There is an attack on the priesthood in the Eucharist, a violent one. The object of that attack is to change the doctrine. They'd never admit it, but that's what it is, to Protestantize it. Remove that reality. It's not really Jesus. Well, he's present in many other ways, a true statement. He's present in his word, a true statement. He is. He's present in every one of you in a state of grace. He is. Yes. But he is not present in the same way as he is in the Eucharist. For that is the way of being present higher than every other way. The mode of presence par excellence. And so wake up, church, wake up and strengthen what remains before the whole thing dies and rots in the ground. I find that the sum of your deeds is less than complete in the sight of my God. Call to mind how you accepted what you heard and keep to it and repent. For if you do not rouse yourselves, I will come upon you like a thief at a time you cannot know. This is not a small thing. We have been given a responsibility in the Catholic Church. We have be, been given a sacred deposit. The doctrine of our faith, the pearl of great price, nothing less than the truth. And when the truth is attacked, it is Jesus who is attacked, for he is the truth. So it's not a matter of some abstraction being attacked. It is a matter of the word of God, the truth, Jesus himself, especially in the Eucharist, being attacked. And we'd better darn well strengthen what's weak lest we lose all we have and don't say it could never happen. For it happened in bigger churches than exist in the United States throughout history. It happened in Africa. It happened other places. It could happen again. Now I realize that you have a few persons who have not soiled their garments, who have not given themselves over to heresies and immorality. These shall walk with me in white, because they are worthy. The promise of the Lord. And if you have failed, if you have fallen, fear not. Jesus is all mercy. If you have not embraced the fullness of the faith before, if you've had difficulty accepting all the church's teaching, if you have been easily seduced or duped by these specious interpretations, by these plausible lies, don't panic, don't despair. Jesus loves you, and he calls you back. And if we repent, he can do more through us and for us in the twinkling of an eye than we could do in a thousand years. So even if you live like a pagan for 90 years and on your deathbed you repent and you embrace the truth, don't have the slightest doubt or fear. 
God can make a saint out of you in 10 seconds or less. And he wants to. So don't worry. Just go the right way. And praise the Lord all the way. And then to the presiding angel in the church of Philadelphia. Not in Pennsylvania either. <laughs> but it could be in Pennsylvania. Or New York. Or California. Or London. Any place. Any time. The Holy One. The true who wields David's key. Who opens and no one can close. And who closes and no one can open has this to say. <clears throat> I know your deeds. That is why I have left an open door before which no one can close. I know your strength is limited. Now, I like this one. I know your strength is limited. Jesus, through the power of his Spirit, says to you and to me, I know your strength is limited. I know you're tired. My friends, I become very, very weary of all this. I'm sick of it all. And I want to quit. I have quit 10,000 times. I really have. I've thrown in the towel more times than I can count. You know, I, I go out and I say, okay, I'm going to do this. All right, Lord, here we go. You know, kind of like Jeremiah. You know, he'd preach the word of God, and then they'd pound on him, put him down a cistern, try to kill him, all kind of stuff. And then he'd say, oh, Lord, you, know, you don't uphold me. Look what this people does. I just try to preach your word, and they persecute me. And I say, no more. I'm not going to preach your word anymore. I'm not going to be a witness anymore. I'm not going to resist this pagan world anymore. All right, inside the church, they're persecuting me. No more, I've had enough. I quit. And then, like a fire welling up in my bones, and I can't keep it in, I'm going to explode. And out it comes. You see, we get tired. I know your strength is limited. Yet you have held fast to my word and have not denied my name. I mean to make some of Satan's assembly. Here we go again. Jesus is talking through his spirit to the church. I mean to make some of Satan's assembly. And, and who are they? Out, Satanists out there doing Satanism? Nope. Nope. That's not what he's talking about. I mean to make some of Satan's assembly. They're in here, in the church. Those self-styled Jews. Now remember, Jews are referring to the ones inside the house of God, not outside. Imposters to the throne. I mean to make some of Satan's assembly, those self-styled Jews who are not really Jews but frauds, some of those self-styled Catholics who are not really that, but frauds. I mean, to make them come and fall down at your feet, and they will learn of my love for you in that way. Believe me, the day is coming where a great many who are in error will be shown the error of their ways, and they will come to the true church, they will come to many of you and beg for forgiveness, and you'll give it to them. Forgiveness, I mean. <laughs> now we must be nice. Because you have kept my plea to stand fast, I will keep you safe in the time of trial. I will keep you safe right now and in the days to come. I will keep you safe because you've held fast. The trial that is coming on the whole world to test all men on earth. 
Yes, you could say that is a message for all history. Yes. In a special way, I believe it is a message for us. We are in a time of trial. We are being tested to see what is in our heart, to see if we will obey God. You know, anybody can say, Lord, Lord, when everything goes well. Everybody can say, praise the Lord, when it is de rigueur to be Catholic and Christian. Back in the 50s, you know, you, you, were, you were looked down upon by society if you didn't go to church on Sunday. Nowadays, might be just the opposite. You're considered a little weird if you get too much religion. You know, you, you bunch of fanatics. <laughs> yeah, your own family might think that about you in some cases. Well, I'm just going to church on Sunday. Oh, you do it too much. You did that last month. <laughs> Hold fast to what you have, lest someone rob you of your crown. Let me say it again. Hold fast to what you have. What do you have? You have the fullness of truth in your Catholic faith. You have the Blessed Eucharist, the Blessed Mother. You've got the pearl of great price. Hold fast to it. Lest some slippery-tongued devil talk you out of it, out of your crown. Talk you out of your faith, talk you out of your crown. Go together. I will make the victor a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall never leave it. I will inscribe on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which you will send down from heaven in my own name which is new. Let him who has ears heed the Spirit's word to the churches. Do you love the church? Yes, I think you do. I do too. Do you know what the church is? Some people will say, we are church. Yes. Yes. But if the only thing that's church is you and me, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm out of here. Because <laughs> I really can't depend on you, absolutely speaking, and you can't depend on me, absolutely speaking, because we're human. We're sinners. We buckle under pressure. We might fail each other. The church is a lot more than that. I remember a story from the Second Vatican Council. There were some Protestant theologians talking to a cardinal. They were observers at the council. And they were kind of needling the cardinal, and they said, Catholic Church is in trouble. You're on the rocks. Not going to last much longer. And the cardinal says, you boys going to do away with it? And they just looked at him and he said, hey, look, boys, we've been trying to do it for 2,000 years and we haven't succeeded. <laughs> Meaning we've been messing things up ourselves all along the way and we haven't been able to destroy it. God built it. The church is the head, Jesus Christ, the soul, the Holy Spirit, all the blessed in heaven in purgatory and all those on earth in union with all of the above. That's the church. What a cloud of witnesses we have spurring us on to victory. The church is not just a few people on the face of the earth here, there, or over there. The church is a whole lot more than that, and a good thing, too. The church is indefectibly holy. Why? 
Because of you? Nope. Because of me? Oh, no. The church is indefectibly holy because of Christ, her head, and her soul, the Holy Spirit. That's why the church is indefectibly holy. That's why the church can never fail. Our faith is built on the rock who is Christ, the prognosticators of doom, the morticians of God, have been predicting for a long time that the church is going down. The church is still here. They're all gone. Oh, they keep predicting it. God is dead, one of them said. God isn't dead. He isn't even sick. <laughs> He's alive and well. And so don't be frightened, don't be swayed by any of that stuff. The church, the new Jerusalem. How much does Jesus love his church? Well, you look at a crucifix and you will see. The church came forth from the wounded side of Christ and then was manifest on Pentecost with the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, which strengthened the church. Let him who has ears heed the Spirit's word to the churches. And then finally, to the presiding spirit or angel of the church in Laodicea, write this. The Amen, the faithful witness and true, the source of God's creation, has this to say to you. Church, right here, right now, I know your deeds. You see how that keeps repeating? I know your deeds. He really does. He's God. He sees everything hidden in darkness. He knows what's in your mind and what's in your heart. Every thought we ever had, he knows. Every word we ever spoke or failed to speak, he knows. It's a good thing his name is mercy. I know your deeds. I know you are neither hot nor cold, church in America. I know you are neither hot nor cold. How I wish you are one or the other, hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Frightening words, transcendent words, relevant words. You are neither hot nor cold. Are you zealous for the faith? What does your life revolve around? Is it your faith? Is it God? Is it Jesus Christ? Or is there a false God somewhere? Money? Your profession? Power, prestige? Sex? Drugs? Rock and roll? Do you have a false God, an idol in your life? Are you hot for the things of the world, but rather cold towards God? And you say, no, neither one. Ah, then you're lukewarm. You don't get too excited about anything. But I'm not committing mortal sins. I don't commit murder. One time I had a guy come to confession. He said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And I'm not even going to tell you his sins. I don't remember. I just remember how he started. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I did not commit murder. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Honest, that's how he started. Well, good, I'm glad. And then he told me he didn't do this, and he didn't do this, and he didn't do this, and I knew he was leading up to something good. 
And he, and he said then, he said, actually, Father, I, I really don't commit. And he sins. Uh, believe it or not, every now and then somebody does that. They're sincere. They don't know how to examine their conscience. See, they, no one's ever told them. I, I don't, I'm not making fun of that man or blaming him. We are called to such a high, noble, exalted vocation. What is our vocation? To become the living presence of Jesus Christ. That's our vocation, our calling. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. Most of us would say we fall short. I sure do. And I know it. But that's not an excuse to cop out. We have to keep trying. I sin by omission as well as commission. You know, every now and then on television we'll see one of these ads for the poor people. You know, people starving in Africa or Asia, um, victims of wars and so forth. I'm glad that I don't have money. I used to have a lot of money at one time in my life. I'm glad I don't have any now because, you know, I wouldn't have a day of peace if I did because I'd always be wondering, hey, as long as there's one of them left on the face of the earth, what am I doing, you know, with a million bucks in the stock market, CDs? Oh, you've got to have a little bit, a little extra. All right. You've got to have a house. You've got to take care of yourself, admittedly. I met Mother Teresa last year before she died. Ninety days to the day before she passed on to her reward, I was preaching down in Washington, D.C., the National Rosary Congress. Got a phone call. Mother wants you to come to the convent, celebrate Mass. She was in town to receive the highest award Congress can bestow on a civilian. I went and celebrated Mass. After the sisters said, are you Father Karapi? I said, yes. And Mother would like to meet with you privately. They brought me in a little room. Mother came in in a wheelchair. And we talked for about, I don't know how long, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. Among other things, she said to me, Father, you know, since we started in 1946, we have picked up over 70,000 dying men out of the streets of Calcutta. I remember the first one, as well as the last, half eaten by worms, lying in the gutter. I picked them up with my own hands, put them in the cart and wheeled them home. We put them in a bed and made him comfortable, cleaned up his wounds, he looked up at me, and he said, all my life, I've lived in the street like an animal, and now I'm going to die like an angel. And he did. The world is filled with pain and suffering. Missionaries of Charity recently invited me to go to Calcutta in January to preach a series of retreats, to go to their leper colony. I think it would be a very good thing for me. I think I need to see a lot more of that. I think I need to realize a lot more that Jesus cried from the cross, I thirst, needs an answer. But unless you're on fire for the Lord, Unless you're not lukewarm, you'll never lift a finger to help God's little one. Insofar as you did it for the least of my brethren, you did it for me. You keep saying, I am so rich and secure, America, church in America. I am so rich and secure. I want for nothing. Little do you realize how wretched you are, how pitiable and poor, how blind and naked. Mother Teresa used to say that the poorest 
of the poor are really those in the affluent countries who are spiritually dead. That spiritual poverty is the worst form of all. Physical poverty won't lose your soul for you. That lack of grace will. How poor you are, America. Oh, you'll say how rich. The stock market doing better than it's ever done. How comfortable, how secure, how fat and happy we are. While God's little ones perish miserably all over the face of the earth, including right here, right now, in our own country. Take my advice. Buy from me gold refined by fire. In order to purify gold, you put it in a crucible. You subject it to intense heat. The dross is burned off. In order to purify you and me, God puts us in a crucible of suffering. In order to burn off the dross of self-will, he turns up the heat. We want to jump out of the pot. I can't take it. Buy from me gold refined by fire. The fire of love. The great doctor of the church, St. John of the Cross, once said, I saw the river over which every soul must pass to the kingdom of heaven. And the name of that river is suffering. And I saw the boat which carries souls across that river. And the name of that boat is love. Are we filled with charity, the fire of charity, or are we lukewarm? We need to be purified in that fire. Buy white garments in which to be clothed in the shame of your nakedness. You don't want to go and stand before God naked. You remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? They disobeyed God, our first parents. Then they hid themselves, for they realized they were naked. What does it mean? It means that the aura of grace which surrounded them was removed because of sin. And they realized they're naked. You don't want to go and stand before God Almighty having been given the precious gift of time and have nothing to show for it. God invests that precious commodity in you and he wants a return on his investment in you and me. Don't go before him naked. Clothe yourselves with good works, with virtue. Buy ointment to smear on your eyes if you would see once more. Immorality blinds us to truth. Mortal sin gouges out our moral and spiritual eyes and we can no longer see the truth even though it's right in front of our face. Jesus, eternal truth, stood before Pontius Pilate and he said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. Pilate, blinded by his cowardice, blinded by his immorality, said, Truth? What does that mean? Staring truth right in the face. By ointment, to anoint your blind eyes that you might see the splendor of God's truth. Whoever is dear to me, I reprove and chastise. Be earnest about it, therefore. Repent. Repent and know that God's name is mercy. Repent and know that he sent his only son to suffer and die on a cross. 
that we might live with him in heaven for all eternity. Here I stand, knocking at the door. If anyone hears me calling and opens the door, I will enter his house. I will enter his soul, his heart, his mind, and have supper with him and he with me. I will give the victor the right to sit with me in my, on my throne as I myself won the victory and took my seat beside my father on the throne. Let him who has ears heed the Spirit's word to the church right here, right now, apocalypse now. And may the good Lord in his great mercy fill every one of us with that power, that spirit who is all fire, remembering that Jesus said, I have come to cast fire on the earth. And oh, how I long that it already be ignited. My brothers and sisters, be that fire. Be that fire which sheds the warmth of love and the light of truth wherever you go. And be consoled to know that fire is contagious. People will see that fire and they'll come to the Lord. And one day all together as God's holy family we'll stand there in the light of his presence when all the dust of battle is settled, when the sounds of war are stilled, when every tear is wiped away, and you and I will hear those blessed words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. God love you. Goodbye. <laughs>